Hello, my name is Ken Kinter and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. The purpose of this presentation is to provide an introduction or maybe a review to group facilitation, specifically for people who may have been running groups for a long time but maybe not have been trained in it formally. This is the first video in a series. I'm not sure at this time how many videos are going to be in the series. There's a lot to do uh, regarding group, I'm looking at maybe at least four videos, but this is definitely uh, the starting point. So before we get rolling, I just want to give credit where credit is due. Um, the project that I work for is called the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative. It's an effort to help improve the quality of care and also the working conditions in New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospital. None of that mission would be possible without the financial and other support from the New Jersey Department of Health. So I want to give credit where credit is due there. So let's talk about what we're going to be covering in this video. This video is going to be covering the foundational pieces of group, basically what I refer to as the pregame. So maybe a recipe of all of the stuff, all of the pieces that you would need, the ingredients that you would need. And we'll talk a little bit about how you put those together. In the second video, we'll talk about what happens actually in the group setting. And then there may be videos that follow about working with specific populations, such as people with mental illness um, and, and other topics as well. So in this video, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about the whys of group, which are the therapeutic reasons for running group, uh, differences between different kinds of groups, the facilitator roles and skills that you need both overall to run groups, but then also for those specific types of groups, the therapeutic forces that impact a group, the importance of a clear group purpose, the also significant importance of group planning. Uh, probably the main downfall in groups is when they're not planned properly. And we'll go into that in great detail. Specifically, some paperwork that can help you out called group protocols and lesson plans. We're also going to talk about rounds, dyads, and triads. These are group tools that you can use to help spice up the material that you're bringing, keep it interesting for your, for your clients, and also help you. And also, we're going to talk about group exercises and processing. There are very many kinds of group exercises. We're not going to get into all of them beyond just being able to list them out. However, that might be in a subsequent video as well. We'll see. And also the importance of processing the exercises. So let's talk about the advantages of groups. Now, groups rightly are accused of, you know, the primary reason is that they're more cost effective. Rather than doing 10 one-to-one -one sessions, you do one session with 10 people in it. And it's a, valid, uh, it's a valid accusation. However, group brings a lot more to the table uh, than just that. I've worked in individual and group settings for about 30 years now. And there's just a certain element of power in groups that you just don't get in an individual setting. So part of that is <clears throat> you get the feedback from number, uh, a number of people, including a person's peers, which has a whole level of significance apart from the feedback that they might get from the group facilitator. People get to practice their skills in a group setting, in as realistic setting as they can get without being in vivo. Vicarious learning, they learn by seeing what happens with other people, very effective form of learning. How many things have you learned in your life from watching something happen to someone else and go, yeah, I'm not doing that, or I'm definitely gonna do that. So you learn without it happening directly to you. You have group pressure. Group has an identity, and there's also pressure involved. So, and pressure will sometimes cause that person to do something and complete something that maybe they wouldn't any other way. Projections. In the early part of a group, people are looking at each other. They don't know each other, <clears throat> but they make judgments about each other based on what they see. And that's pretty important. Projections say a lot about the person doing the projecting, not so much about the person being projected upon, but that process is critical. Resemblance to real life. And the, the groups of people, we are social animals. Groups are the unit of, that we, we are in a number of groups at any given point in time in our lives. And this gives someone a chance to change who they are in that group. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. And then also universality. Uh, most people's problems, I would say anybody's problems, can be made worse by the feeling that it's only happening to me and I'm all alone in this. And just the sheer idea of being in a group with people fights that theory. You know, here's a group of people and they're going through the same thing as me. And some of them are doing better and some of them are doing worse. It's not just me. And that's helpful all by itself. And that's a silent message that gets sent out in group. Uh, if you look in Yalom's book, which is mentioned in the reference section, these are some of the, the vital aspects of the group experience that he talks about, altruism, which is people just helping each other out, doing good for each other. 
catharsis, which is this emotional release. I'll give an example of a catharsis. You can be at a funeral and you can feel like you're okay and everything's all right and then something happens and then the tears come. That, that catharsis is necessary and it's therapeutic and it's helpful, even though it's probably unpleasant in a lot of cases. You can have positive catharsis as well. Uh, identification, people finding out who they are in, re in reference to other people. Family reenactment, that is that people learn how to act in a group of people in their own families and some of those patterns are dysfunctional. Now in group you have a chance to undo that you know, to show, for example, boundary relationships and things like that. Instilling hope, proof that people do better. It's helpful when those people are in the room as opposed to you just telling them about it. Uh, universality we talked about already. Socialization, people have more people to talk to and get feedback from. Interpersonal learning, people learn from each other. Very often, in, I notice people in a group learn more from the peers than they actually do from the facilitator, and that's a good thing. Group cohesiveness, they form a, a group identity uh, together and they stick together. You know, anything you go through, especially anything difficult, there's a bond there that gets created with the people around you. And then existential factors, you know, everybody kind of struggling with the same greater questions about life. And now you're on a journey with a bunch of people doing the same thing. So there are different kinds of groups. And these, these uh, we're going to go through each of these. They're not that clearly defined. Your group can have multiple goals of these. But the important part of this is, if you know what your goal, what your group actually resembles out of these, then that can tell you what your role is as a facilitator in making that group happen. So we have educational groups, discussion groups, task groups, growth slash experiential, counseling slash therapy groups, support groups, and self-help groups. So let's, let's break those down, talk a little about each of those and the you know, facilitator's role in them. So an education group is just a group where we're here to learn. So the group leader, group facilitator is the one who brings that information. And that's pretty much it. You facilitate the discussion, but you, the leader, bring the information. Discussion group. A discussion group, the leader doesn't have to bring the information. They just come and talk, which is, can be about uh, current events, whatever topic. The leader may just bring a topic or maybe not even that. So it's, it's very similar to an education group, except less active role by the facilitator. Next, we have a task group. And very often these are called focus groups as well. This group is just put together for one purpose. And then as soon as that purpose is accomplished, the group disbands. You see these in the working world all the time. Here's a group of people to get this job done. They get the job done, it ends. The leader's role in task groups is to keep the group on task and keep the process moving forward. You know, your primary role is keeping the group from getting distracted. Growth and experiential groups are like training groups. You develop a personal goal, you're growing, you're improving, you're changing, and the leader's job is to bring a bunch of activities to help facilitate that growth and that, that experiential aspect. Counseling therapy groups are, you know, very, depending on where you work, you've seen a lot of these where the facilitator is kind of a group counselor. And we taught the, the, the material used in the group is the personal material of the individuals in the group. So you get them talking about each other's personal issues and you're trying to get everybody involved, both in helping each other and also sharing about themselves. A support group, the members have a common thing uh, that bring them all together, but it is run by a professional. The leader doesn't necessarily share. There's a differentiation in roles there, but the leader is trying to get the members to share and also to uh, encourage and help each other. And the last one, the self-help group, you know, AA may be the best model of this, the 12-step groups. There really is no difference between the leader and the other group members. It's just a member who's taking on leadership uh, responsibilities. You don't need a professional in the room. Leadership can even rotate. So that's, again, that's the 12-step model. So you can see that these aren't so clearly defined. You can have elements of a group that's part of one and part of another. And what type of group that is gives you a good head start as to what your job as the facilitator would be and how active you are and how similar your role is uh, to the other people in the group. So again, here are the, the different tax, tasks regarding facilitation. If you're running an education group, such as a, a college class, it's your job to bring the information. 
you want to be energetic, keep people in the group, uh, and keep them involved. In a discussion, you just want to encourage people to talk. You know, get them to talk about the topics uh, that are going on and make sure everybody gets involved. A task group, as we said, it's just about focus. Keep the group focused, keep them on task, keep them moving toward solutions. And of course, the group subsequent end. Uh, growth, growth in experiential groups. The challenge here is to manage the different relationships between the people in here. They may form different groups, they may find commonality, there may be splits. So it's the facilitator's job to prevent uh, the group from kind of splitting off that way. In a support group, you want to just keep the, the emphasis on support. People are there to help each other. It's not like an education or discussion group where people are there just to talk about something. There's much more of an emotional component, uh, helping reinforce that everybody's in the struggle together and we can all help each other get better. Uh, counseling and therapy groups. Um, you know, again, you have to have a counseling or therapy background to do these things. That's sort of a whole other area. That's the counseling with several people at one time. And then self-help, I don't want to say it's completely leaderless, but it is kind of similar to that. The job, the job of the leader at this point is just to take the group through its normal daily routine. It may be as simple as just suggesting a topic to discuss, um, or it may be um, just keeping people on task and making sure the group responsibilities happen. Uh, in, in many cases, it's helpful if that's rotated and that isn't just on one person all the time. And again, this is very similar to the 12-step model. If you have any questions about self-help groups, I would definitely suggest attending an open 12-step group. Open as in you don't have to have an addiction to participate in the group. It's worth seeing to see how those uh, groups are facilitated and run. Those are also probably around the most common um, type of group going. So very many of our clients attend AA or NA or any of the other offshoots of the 12-step groups. It's good to know how those groups actually operate um, so that you can refer people to them, know when it's going well, know when it isn't, etc. So the roles of the group leader, the group facilitator, you're going to hear me use those words interchangeably. I'm much more of a fan of facilitator. I believe a group should be facilitated instead of very clearly led. Not so sure how much people really want to be led. That's for another, another topic. So one of the main roles of the facilitator is to model the group behavior. The facilitator should be on time. The facilitator should end group on time. The facilitator should be able to politely and impersonally enforce group rules. And you know, in a way be the conscience of the group. Um, the facilitator also handles what's called the balance between content and process. And we'll talk more about that in detail. Content is sort of the written material that goes into the group. The process is the interaction between the people in the group, but we'll, we'll get more into that. So here's a nice list of characteristics that every group facilitator should have. Caring, open, warm, flexible, et cetera, et cetera. Own stuff in check might be a helpful one as well. Also being able to be referee sometimes, dealing with conflicts between clients or dealing with people that have some serious deficits um, in being able to interact with people or maybe symptoms as well. So the question is, you still wanna do this? It's really difficult. You have to do a lot of things at one time. Uh, so yes, it's very challenging. What I would also say is group is a lot of fun. When it works, it's fantastic. And when it doesn't work, it's very educational. And even the bad ones, uh, will help you do your job better. Now, I love group. I find it very exciting, very rewarding. The same group never happens the same way twice. So I think that's, that's part of the, the fun of it. So lots of problems with group. How, how do you know that your group isn't working well? Well, it might be skipping around. Usually drift is a good way to know. The group just doesn't seem that you can't really tell what the group's about if you were watching it from outside. If it's just the leader talking or just the leader reading to the people in the group, it's not going anywhere. There's no, there's no interaction. And people vote with their feet. If they don't like group, they'll stop coming. Um, you know, or it will just be quiet. So there, you, you will know. And there's lots of ways to tell when there's a, a bad group going on. So from the therapeutic aspects, members want to belong. They want to feel like they belong to a group. They want to know that they feel safe. And again, that's part of your role as the facilitator to make sure that they are safe in that group. Are people getting along? Are they talking well together? Are they starting to team up against each other? Because whenever people get together, there's always a hierarchy being formed. And part of your job in that group is that everyone has equal value. 
so that there isn't this real hierarchy effect on someone else. And what's going on with the group identity? Are they, are they coalescing in some way? In video number two, we'll talk about the evolution of a group and how they proceed you know, through this group process, and that's where that group identity is formed. So some of the forces in group that we talked about, these are some elements that are uh, aspects of the group that influence how the group is done. Some of them are outside of the group facilitator's control. So clarity of purpose is one hopefully the facilitator does control. Why are we here? What is this group for? What does this group offer to the people so that they would have a reason to come to it? Group size is an issue. And you wanna have a small group, group five to eight, for, for um, people that have serious difficulties in group, eight to 12 is okay. Once you get above 12, you're starting to get on the thin ice there. You can still run an effective group, but it becomes more difficult. People either have to be in better shape, maybe with less deficits, but it needs to be built that way. How long is the session? Um, where I work in a state hospital, it's difficult to do 45 minute groups. You might not be able to have people stay with you that long. Some 12 step meetings in the community go an hour and a half. Uh, and I've seen groups of, of severely affected people in the hospital where you're lucky to get 20 minutes. Uh, session frequency. If it is less often than once a week, people are gonna forget what they learned and it's really gonna go nowhere. You want a minimum of once a week and in a patient setting where I am, it's very often two and three times a week. Uh, what's the physical room like? You know, is the room too small? Is the room uncomfortable? Is the room noisy? Is there too much noise from the hallway? Are there lots of distractions? These are all things that can negatively impact the group or can positively impact the group if the, if the facilitator knows about them and works accordingly. Time of day is critical. Is the first thing in the morning the best time for this group to be happening? Is it good for that group to be happening right after lunch when everybody's sleepy? Leader attitude is one of the most important forces. Does the facilitator come into that group as in, Oh, I really don't want to be here. When is this going to end? Because that attitude carries over to everybody else. And if people bring energy to it, then that's important uh, as well. That will help. Is the group open or closed? Now, this is, this is worth mentioning because open groups have two different definitions. In the definition that we see in the, the traditional group literature, open means that new people are coming into the group at all times. So every group could be a first group for someone and the membership may change session to session. As opposed to a closed group where, okay, this group starts April 1st and we're keeping the same people the entire time. And then group ends, we disperse, and then we get a new group of people in. So that's the, book, the version that you see in the textbooks. I also want to explain, as I mentioned this before, in 12-step meetings, an open group means that visitors can come to a 12-step group, whereas a closed meeting means that if you're going to a closed AA meeting, it means you have to admit that you have an alcohol problem to be in the room. There are open AA groups, closed AA groups, open and closed NA groups, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a visitor or if you're attending a class, you wanna to go to an open 12-step meeting. So again, that's different than if you're working in a hospital and you hear open versus closed. So uh, be wary of that. Are the people in the group voluntary or were they sent there? That's gonna change the attitude right away. And that's gonna affect some of these other factors, level of commitment, level of trust, level of participation, how the participants in the group feel about the facilitator, how experienced the facilitator is, and then co-leader harmony. So we'll talk a little bit more about co-facilitation, whether you have one person running the group or multiple people, and that's a whole other uh, interesting area of discussion. So one of the key things, one of the cornerstones of whether a group is going to be effective or not is the clarity of its purpose. It could be the most important thing because that's what drives the group forward. Here's what we are working on. If the purpose of this group is being able to cope with bipolar disorder, then every session should tie into that somehow. How can we connect what we're doing today with coping with bipolar disorder? It minimizes distractions, keep people focused. Otherwise, the wind takes the group anywhere uh, it's gonna go. So questions to ask about the purpose. What's gonna help that person? What do they want? Um, good question is, can a group have more than one purpose? Uh, what is the point of today's session? If the overall group has a purpose, each session plugs into that purpose, moving it forward. And 
The purpose should also be somewhat shared between the facilitator, but also getting input from the group as well, because they're the ones who are trying to get somewhere. So the facilitator's job is to help them get there. The purpose can change over time. Uh, and there's an interesting question about who changes the purpose of the group. I'll give you an example of that. I was teaching a class in fall of 2001. Uh, somewhere between week two and week three of the semester, 9-11 happened, and we had students in the class who lost significant others, lost parents. Uh, I come into class about two days after it happened and looked at the room and just looked at everybody's face and said, okay, I don't think chapter three is going to cut it today. So I said, well, we're going to talk about chapter three or we're going to talk about what's going on. And we basically had a venting session of over an hour. That's what needed to happen. So the facilitator of an education group or task group um, saw what was going on in the room, asked the room. They had a pretty clear feeling about what they wanted to do. And we went that way. Can there be no purpose to a group? There probably can be, but it sounds like the, what, what's the point of it then? Why are these people even there if there is no purpose to it? Uh, the leader has to be clear so that the members can be clear on the purpose. And even groups that have one single session or a group where you have people coming and going every session, it's never the same people twice. It's always someone's first group, it's always someone's last group. There, we refer to this as a standalone group, which is that even if the group is one of a long series, even if someone just shows up to one, they get something out of it. You know, some TV shows where TV shows, you have to watch them from the beginning. Otherwise, you don't know what the heck is going on. But then there are other shows where even if you just drop in somewhere, the show makes sense. So that's kind of what that, uh, what that single session looks like. So an interesting question is, how do you evaluate the impact of groups on people? You know, very often people just say, well, of course, it's a good group. The, the clients like it. Well, how do you know? Well, I ask them or they keep coming. That's a good start. But you can do better than that, too. How can you measure progress through what people are accomplishing while they're in the group? You can have them fill out forms, say what they like and don't like about the group. They, don't be afraid to have them evaluate you. It, it helps make the group better. And I like asking, what do people like about the group? What do people dislike about the group? If I, the way I usually frame it is, I'm going to be doing this group again somewhere down the line. What can I do to make it better? You know, and then get the feedback uh, from them as well. So group planning. So as, as I mentioned before, if one of those cornerstones is the purpose, another cornerstone is planning. Plan the group in advance so that you don't get surprised because you also need to walk into a room with, here's what I think we're going to do today. And then also, here's the backup plan because sometimes you just get overruled or sometimes it's just not possible. And you don't want to be caught at a loss. You always want to have plan A and plan B. So planning for all stages of groups, stages we'll talk about in the, the second video. How do we deal with those forces? How are we gonna deal with that time of day? I very often get people at trainings at, at right at the end of the week, Friday afternoon, last session. They're tapped out, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're thinking about going home. So how do I hold their attention? My energy level is gonna be different then than if I catch them first thing in the morning or at some other time of the day or the week. Uh, how are People screen for the group is a good question as well. Do you have any say over who comes into your group? Because what you want to have, you see these words homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homogeneous is that the people have similarity, uh, that they, they have more in common with each other. Uh, a place, place where I worked in the past, we had a group about bipolar disorder and we weren't screening who was coming in. So at one point, no one in the group was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. That there is a screening problem. Uh, and then also heterogeneous. You don't want to have the, everybody in the group be exactly the same. So there's a nice part about having people that are different in the group, but there has to be some sort of commonality uh, to connect them. And to sum this up, planning to fail is, or failing to plan is planning to fail. This has been attributed to a great number of people, but there's a lot of controversy over who actually said it. So I'm not going there, but I love the saying, if, if you wait until the moment of truth to come up with a plan, it's not going to work. So some of the questions you want to ask yourself when you're putting together a group, what content do you want to cover? If you're covering a topic, what are all the elements that you want to cover? What's the order that you cover those topics in? How much time should each of those uh, topics get? 
how much time do you need for the introduction and for the wrap up? Cause you don't just walk in the room and say, okay, today we're going to talk about this. So there's a lot of planning that has to be involved, a lot of work up front in the group. Now, the good part is if you do that work up front, you can always take that upfront work with you each time you do the group afterwards and tweak it. But if you wing it, then you're, you're always starting over, uh, starting over again. So there are two forms. And if you want these forms, you can email me and I'll, I'll send them to you. My contact information is on the title slide. So what you have, there are things called group protocols and group lesson plans. This is the content that's on something called a group protocol. So this is, if I'm going to be running a group, say a men's group, uh, this is where I figure out all of the specifics about that group. So for example, okay, so the title, men's group, purpose, rationale. What is the meaning of this group? What is the purpose of this group? What am I going toward with this? And we have anticipated outcomes. What are the entrance criteria? For example, for men's group, an entrance criteria might be uh, that someone is in fact a man. However, interesting question comes up. What if somebody identifies as a man? You know, so these are the, these are the things, again, do you want to figure that out in the room on session one, or do you want to have handled some of this before this actually comes down? Methodology. Here's where we look at all these forces. How often are we going to meet? How many people are going to be there? What kind of stuff do we need to actually make this happen? Exit criteria. How do we know when someone's done that they've either gotten their maximum benefit out of the group, or they're just not going to be able to move forward with it? And then also, how is this all going to be documented? So if the, the protocol covers the entire totality of the group. So for each session, you have a group lesson plan, identical to a lesson plan in school. So here are the components of this. So the first part of the group is introduction. You know, hi, I'm Ken. Welcome to men's group. Today, we're going to be talking about dot, dot, dot. And then maybe there's an icebreaker exercise. You know, if you had to think of name a great man from your experience, a man who had a, a huge influence on you and who you are today, it's an icebreaker. It's just an introductory exercise to get people talking, but it also kind of warms people up for the topic. Orientation. What are we learning today? How is this going to help you? And how are we going to get there? You know, the, the benefits of participation in the method. Uh, and then we get into the activity. Now, in the field of psychiatric rehabilitation, we're very, very big on something called tell, show, do. Tell, show, do. Talk about it, show it, and then have the person do it. Give them practice. Uh, the most basic example of this I think about is changing a tire. I can tell you how to change a tire. Does that mean you're going to remember it in the moment of truth or be able to do it when you actually have to do it? Well, what happens if I tell you how to change a tire and then I show you how to change a tire? Okay, that's better because now you've seen somebody do it. You've seen some of how it's done. Tell, show, and then do. So now after that, you get to change the tire. You've done it once. And I think the odds of someone being able to complete the task when they really need it um, is conditional on going through all of these. That way, no matter what type of learner someone is, they've gotten, uh, you've gotten them through that method of learning. And then at the end, the summary. What did people learn in group today? And can they learn this, can they use this information somewhere outside of group? So if you are going into a group and you do not have a group protocol and you do not have group lesson plans, my heartfelt suggestion would be find them and get them. Again, I'm happy to send you some template forms that we came up with so that you can fill those out yourself. Have that stuff when you walk in there. Doing a group without a protocol and without a lesson plan is like building a house without a blueprint. It's going to go bad on it's just going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So some of the problems with planning, people don't. They go in, they wing it. Uh, planning for group basically looks like printing something off the internet five minutes before a group starts. There's also over planning. If you try to book every minute of a group, uh, that's not going to go well for you either. You don't want to skip things or miss things that were important. Uh, the timing and the order are both critical. Sometimes you have to go through one whole series of group before you realize how that works. If you start a group, uh, you know, from completely from nothing, I guarantee it's going to change. By the time you go through that first series of sessions, you will change it. Timing is brutal. I think it's the hardest part to get. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then another critical part is not being familiar with the material. Uh, it'll become very obvious really fast if you don't know the material, it will show. And, and maybe the clients know more about it than you do. 
off to a side topic, sometimes that's helpful and you can use that. Uh, if I do a group on addictions and I've got a room full of people who've been addicts as long as I've been alive, I want to access that information. So there's a strategy to not trying to be the master of all as well. So some of the other aspects of some of the general aspects of group facilitation, active listening, being a good listener is one of the most critical. You know, I would say that and modeling are two of the most important skills a group facilitator can have. Reflection, just being able to send back to people what they've said to you so they can hear what they've said to you. Um, clarification, open-ended questions, summarizing, uh, linking, you know, remembering what people said across groups and bringing it back in, being able to do mini lectures, but also being able to step out of that. You want to have as much interaction going on in the room as possible, not just you to them. It should be everyone interacting with everyone. Uh, use of praise and affirmations. Now, if you see these red letters here, they actually spell out ORs. Uh, we have a couple of videos on motivational interviewing. I definitely suggest that you uh, check those out as well on our website uh, because that will tell you more about how to do this ORS business. And, and that is a very helpful uh, series of skills for, uh, for doing group. It's also important to know the subject. You provide a therapeutic atmosphere. A group should be fun. You actually want it to be a place that you would go. You know, if, if, it isn't, if it isn't fun for you, it's not fun for anybody else either. Uh, watch individual uh, interactions. You're also in charge of time. You know, start the group on time. Finish the group on time. People should automatically know uh, that that's happening. You also bounce the participation. You want to hear from everybody during the course of a group. And then as we talked about before that process content balance, we'll talk about that uh, quite a bit of time. So other aspects. Uh, that we've talked about in this is uh, self-disclosure. All right, now this one's a judgment call. You're the group facilitator. How much do you share about yourself? So kind of two rules of thumb about this. One is uh, don't say anything in group that you don't mind being everywhere where you work because that's where it's going to be sooner or later. So don't say anything that you don't want out there being public domain. The other element of it is are you sharing this for you or are you sharing this for the betterment of the group? And that's a tricky question to answer. Um, when I am not sure what to do, I will usually say, you know, I worked with someone in the past, dot, 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 and then I tell the story, you know, my story, but I make it look, sound like it's about someone else. So I try to take me out of it. Uh, your use of eyes, your use of eye contact is critical. When you're looking at someone, you're inviting them, you're eliciting them to speak. When you withdraw your eye contact from someone, you are basically, that's the most subtle form of trying to cut that person off. Your use of your voice. Do you have a very loud demonstrative voice? Do you have a very quiet, soft-spoken voice? How are you using your voice to get your point across and emphasis? What's your energy level like? Now, you don't have to be high energy and extremely enthusiastic to be successful in groups. Some people are good with very calm and very laid back. It's a matter of finding out what works for you in your own uh, personal style. You look in a room, who's going to be helping you? Who are your challenges going to be? Uh, there's a funny uh, element of group where the people who are going to work with you and help you usually sit very close to you, like on either side, and be careful that person's sitting on the opposite side from you. That's usually where your trouble is. Not always, but it's worth finding that out. It's also a funny thing how people claim a certain space in a group and they tend to keep it. That's a whole other element altogether. There are also, multi uh, also multicultural issues regarding group. Uh, for example, not all cultures are 100% comfortable with the group process. It may not be perfect for everybody. Some people love being in a group talking about it. Some people find it rude or inappropriate to share their materials with groups. So that's something to look out for too. Just check in with people. You know, it, it, it one size does not fit all, including the group uh, format. And then this million dollar question, are you leading a group you would actually enjoy going to? If you're not, you got to change it. All right, so let's talk about co-facilitation. Now, you may work in a place where it's not financially viable to have more than one group facilitator. I love co-facilitation. It's how I learned best. If you partner someone who is a seasoned group facilitator with someone who's new, you will end up with two good group facilitators. If you pair two new people who don't really know what they're doing, you're going to have two bad group facilitators, and they're just as likely to pick up their own bad habits. So... Um, some of the advantages of co-facilitation, it makes it easier because you have two people being able to 
uh, pass it back and forth, kind of like a news broadcast where you have people uh, bringing their own elements to it. You have the, the aspect of more experience. There's also this little weird piece where you're modeling the family unit a bit. There might be a little parent thing going on, but you're also modeling a relationship now. Instead of you just being the group facilitator, modeling being a, a therapeutic professional, you now have this relationship going on. And I think it's also helpful if it's a male-female relationship. If those facilitators don't have a whole lot you know, visibly in common, I think that sends out a message as well. Uh, disadvantages are, okay, now you've, that whole bit of it being efficient, you've now reduced the efficiency. The other part is, what happens if you have group co-facilitators who clash? What happens if they don't get along so well together? Uh, that's a challenge. I've had that experience before. And the facilitator and I had to spend time after group getting ourselves on the same page again, because we don't want to have a problem in group in front of everybody. You know, we don't want to have that leading to splitting the group. It can take a little more time or coordination where we got to talk before group or process afterwards. So there are some complicating factors. My belief is co-facilitation is preferable to just having one facilitator, but it's not always possible. I would do co-facilitation whenever possible and anyone that you co-facilitate with, you learn from and they learn from you. So that's a, that's a beautiful thing. The other piece I would add about co-facilitation is I would never have the co-facilitator sit next to each other. I like having the one person who's sort of leading and doing the content. And then you have that other person sitting kind of in the back of the room, watching and seeing what's going on and then jumping in from time to time. That person who's jumping in usually has a much better feel of what's going on in the room. There's just way too many tasks to keep track of at one time. So we're gonna move on to rounds, dyads, and triads. Rounds are one of my favorite ways to make sure I get everybody involved in a group together. So all around is, it's just going literally around the room to hear from everybody. Two basic rules, keep it quick and make sure you don't leave anyone out. If someone wants to pass, they can pass, but you do wanna hear from everybody. So here's some quick examples of, of some rounds that I find extremely helpful. One designated word round. So an example that might be, okay, um, all right, so tell me how you're feeling today in terms of a weather report. Just one, two or three words, we're just gonna whip around the room real fast and I just wanna hear if it's clear and sunny, clear and sunny. If it's stormy, whatever, we'll just go around the room and you can pass if you want, but we wanna get everybody. So that's a round. And if you hear back from somebody that they're a hurricane or a tornado, if you've heard that right in the beginning of group, now you know what's going on and you're ready. And that's one of the reasons for doing it. It's also a neat version to do that round at the beginning of a group and then again at the end. You wanna see how your hurricanes and your thunderstorms are doing, or if you've developed any other ones along the way. Designated number round, uh, I did an anger management group, and I'd say, okay, so we're gonna go around the room and wanna hear how angry you are right now on a scale of one to 10. One is not angry at all, 10 is, as angry as I've ever been, complete rage. Again, I wanna pay attention to my numbers. You'll hear someone give you a number higher than 10. You wanna know who that person is right off the bat. Again, you can repeat that round at the end to see where the numbers went. And there's no harm in writing the numbers down too so you can keep track of where everybody is. You can also have a comment round, short answer. There's, there's any number of rounds uh, that you can do. So the purpose of doing these things is you know, it's when a group of people get together, there's like a ritual that happens first. If you go to church or you go to a sporting event, there are these things that happen first that don't really specifically have to do with the thing going on, but it's getting people in the mood. It's separating from what was on the outside to what we're doing now. Get comfortable, get set, get focused, get your energy right. You know, let everybody know that they're all participants in this process. You want to hear from everybody. There are people that are very quick to jump out and speak right away, maybe even overshare. We'll talk about those in video number two. And then you'll have the other people that you really have to like pull teeth to get something out of them, but you want to hear from them. So other aspects of uh, these rounds we talked about, you want to give people the right to pass. Uh, you want to give people time to be able to process them. And where you start is interesting. You can just say, hey, let's just, it, a round doesn't have to be say left to right or right to left. It can be on a volunteer basis, but again, you wanna make sure you get everybody. I like to vary it. So that way people aren't 100% comfortable uh, with where they are. Another thing I like to vary is where I sit in the group. I like to move where I sit in the group or I move and then that makes other people move. And sometimes that's a nice way to disrupt the group and you know, bring some uh, new energy 
uh, into it. So now we're going to be working up into uh, uh, dyads and triads. Now I'm sure you've been to a training or a group where they've recommended that people break into groups of two or a dyad uh, to process something. Very common when you have a new group or an assembly where you have a whole room full of people you don't know. That can be nerve wracking for people. So you break them down into dyads, that way you only have to know one person. So you've been in these groups where they've said, okay, talk to the other person and then you introduce them and then they introduce you and you learn something about them. It's a standard, standard strategy. I think it's very effective. I like it. Uh, it gets the energy up. The other aspect, the other really good thing about uh, the dyads is that if you're stuck, if you're getting in a situation and you don't know what to do, and you can give them an exercise or something they can do in groups of two, then you can walk around and see how people are doing, but it also gives you a timeout, it gives you a timeout to think and refocus. Really nice parts about rounds, dyads, and exercises is it gives you time, and that's important. You don't have the answers for everything when you walk in the room. So again, you wanna have very clear instructions for people they will get lost i always say put your hand up if uh, you know if you miss anything or if you get stuck and someone always does um with if you're the facilitator one of the challenges is this never fails whenever you're going to do dyads you always have an odd number of people in the room you can have a group of three or if you want you can partner up with that other person it's your call i kind of prefer to monitor the whole room so i'd rather have that group of three and me being able to move around and see what everybody's doing but it's a judgment call. Um, and then also can be done in triads in groups of three uh, as well. Okay, so now we're moving on to, to processing. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about exercises and processing now. There are so many different types of exercises, and we've listed many of them out, but I'm not going to have a chance to talk to all about them here. You don't want a group to be what my supervisor calls talkies where it's the facilitator talking. It's not like when you were in school and the teacher just talks and you just listen. You want to have things be a lot more interactive. Um, so you, you have a limitless palette of things that you can do to try to get your message across in a fun way, in an informative way, and in an engaging way, which hopefully is better than just reading or talking. So again, we want to keep people's energy up. You know, what's that word, edutainment? You know, you want to educate and you entertain at the same time. That way that material uh, actually sticks. So we're going to talk a little bit more about focus in the next video, but the idea of the focus of the group is, is on that group's purpose for that specific uh, session. And exercises can be very uh, helpful at that. So we'll talk about types of exercises, written exercises we talked to about already. Uh, tell me about a, a very enjoyable time in your life, a time where you really felt like you were at the top of your game and why was that? That says something important about that person. Movement exercises. People just sitting in chairs in a circle, not the most helpful uh, modality in the world. How can you get people up and moving around and get that energy going? Arts and crafts. People are very often engaged by having a task to do. I found out years ago that when people were engaged in a task, they were much more likely to talk about heavy, meaningful stuff than just one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a room around the desk. There's something disarming about that. Kind of similar when somebody goes for a drive. People go for a drive and they talk about everything. So very many types of groups. There's fantasy groups. There's things that have to do with, uh, with reading. There's some examples of the written exercises here. Examples of movement exercises where you deliberately have people change seats. You can have people shape, which is you, you just form shapes of people based on how uh, they get along with each other. There are the, the books that we'll talk about in the references at the end give much more specific examples of these, but it is literally limitless. And the more of these that you have available to you in your toolbox, the better off you'll be in, in running a group. The use of props is pretty critical as well. The more stuff you have, uh, to enable people to get into their role and be able to do um, what it is they want to do. Feedback exercises. This is where people get feedback from the group about something that they do. They get honest opinions, honest but supportive opinions. Sometimes it's the idea of being able to give criticism, but in a friendly and supportive way. 
uh, is extremely helpful. Uh, we talked about the rounds already. I don't know if you guys are familiar with trust falls and things like that. I don't know, depending on where you work, you may not be doing those things, but there are many, many, many types of exercises uh, that can be done. So between the books that are gonna be referenced in the back, we'll, we'll have a lot more discussion about that. So just as important as the exercise, in fact, possibly more important than the exercise, is the processing of the exercise. This is where you actually set the learning that happens in here. Um, when you introduce an exercise, you give people the ability to pass. You don't want to put, force people out of their comfort zone. Um, and again, if you're going to be doing a group, you have to know what your materials are. You have to be ready to do it. You can't get into a room and then say, oh, okay, we don't have room to do this or I don't have the materials. You know, that's, that's a failure on the facilitator's uh, point. So part of your work as the facilitator is keeping people on task, make sure that they understand the instructions and are moving forward, looking to see if anybody is reacting to it in a, in a particular way. Also the time cop piece. One of the biggest challenges in exercises is allowing sufficient time uh, to process. And sometimes it's not critical that they finish the task. If they start it, they start it. They can finish it on their own or you can allocate time in another session to do that. Similar to what we talked about before, if you have the group doing an exercise, do you do it too? Judgment call, you can. If you wanna leave yourself out of it and just leave it to the group, that's probably the simplest way to do it, but sometimes you can also uh, model as well. So as we get into the process, this is where you set the learning. This is where people really understand um, what happened because you're connecting the exercise to what did you learn today? And the exercise should conjure things up for somebody, cause somebody to look at things in a different, in a different way. And again, processing an exercise, you can do it through a round. You know, what did you learn today? You can do it in dyads and triads where they talk to each other all at the same time. That saves time, by the way. Um, they can do it in a written form. You can do it in any which way. The nice part about planning in advance is you figure out the method that you think will be most helpful, and then you do it in the, you know, the, in the group. So some processing questions. These are questions that I like. Did you learn something from this that you did not know before? What feelings did this bring up for you? What did you learn from this exercise that you can use in other areas of your life? You never know when that significant moment is going to be there for somebody, but kind of like the gardener, you want to create the conditions for growth so that that can happen. You never know when it, whenever it will happen. You don't want to dwell on one person. You want to have time for everybody. You want to keep the focus right on the present moment. And this is where that learning really settles in. And uh, when someone's in the exercise, they're thinking about the exercise. When you're processing it, they're hearing what everybody else got, maybe getting a couple me too moments but then also thinking, okay, what, is this, what does this teach me about myself? So this counseling piece, we're not gonna talk about too much, um, you know, if you don't have a, necessarily a therapy background to begin with, but the challenge is always moving toward the goal. The group that you're doing, it's critical that it taps into the client's goal. It helps them get somewhere that they wanna get. Otherwise, why are they there? Um, so outcome goals, changes in a person's life, process goals, changing how they interact with other people. You know, for example, if someone always feels like they're the odd person out, part of the purpose of the group can be to determine, okay, well, is there a way that you make yourself the odd person out? Or is this just a perception that you have that you take with you everywhere you go? So different, different aspect on that. So in a perfect world, you'll have a group that is the right size. You'll have consistent membership. Your membership will be voluntary and highly motivated. They'll have things in common, you'll have a good space and you'll have enough time. You know, you'll, you'll be able to put time aside so that you can do all the tasks of group, including the introduction at the beginning and the summarizing at the end. And you'll have screened all of your clients so that you'll know that they're appropriate to participate in that group. It's entirely possible that in your job, none of these will happen. You will have a group that is uh, all over the place regarding its attendance, too big, too small, involuntary, nothing in common, it might actually be assumable that none of that is going to be. And that's why the onus then becomes on you to create that safe container, that safe pocket that people can do um, their work in. Mistakes that I have made and that you will as well. Uh, one is doing therapy in a group setting with one person, with an audience there. Not so great. 
um, spending too much time on one person, the, the person who takes over the group and you allow them to take over the group. Um, missing people. One of my earliest uh, faults in group was I worked with who spoke. And if someone stayed quiet, I let them stay quiet. And I, I struggle to not do that. That's something I've really worked on. Uh, getting off course, you know, people are fired up about something else. Maybe they're avoiding doing work in group by talking about something irrelevant, and that's where we go. Rescuing people. If people cry, maybe they need to cry. If they're upset, maybe they need to be upset. It's not rescue people from their feelings. They need to feel them. Too much advice giving. And then my last piece on this is something called failing forward. And failing forward, this is how we learn. You learn how to ride a bike probably by falling off a bike. You learn how to catch a ball by getting hit with a ball. <laughs> and through that process, you learn how to do that. Failing is okay. It's the learning how we fail and moving forward that's the challenge. And I love this little saying, mistakes are the stepping stones of, of learning. So ethical legal issues. Don't do what you don't know. Don't get pressured into a situation where you're out of your, you're out of your depth. Seek out training, seek out consultation, get all sorts of additional information. You know, again, if you have a colleague that knows more than you, shadow that person, watch what they do, and then develop your own style off of that. Confidentiality, we could spend a lot of time on that. It's impossible to guarantee group confidentiality. It's important to stress confidentiality, even if it's as simple as, you know, what you see here, what you hear here, let it stay here. Um, and then of course, HIPAA writes as well. You don't talk outside of group about anything that was said in the group. You can say, you know, someone brought up in group or someone talked about, but you never identify a share from inside the group, outside of the group to protect that person's confidentiality. Um, dual relationships are a challenge. What happens if you know that person in more than one setting? Do you know information from one setting in another? If you're that person's social worker and then you had them in a group and they shared something, you can bring it to that person, but you don't want to bring it outside any other way. These, these lines get complicated. Uh, exploitation, informed consent, these are, these are all critical pieces. And do your own darn work. If you have your own personal work to do, if you're running a grief group and you have lots of outstanding grief issues, you got to take care of that stuff because it's going to come into the room. And when it does, it's going to be ugly. And at that point in time, you're going to have a really hard time uh, maintaining your own professionalism. And again, it compromises the health and well-being of the group, which is your primary function. So lots of stuff that we covered here, and we still have a little bit more to cover. Facilitating groups is difficult but it's also awesome. <clears throat> different groups have different roles. You don't run every group the same way in the same place. They're all different. Social skills groups, different from anger management group, or if you do one in a jail, one in a partial care program, one in a hospital. Some facilitator skills are necessary for all groups as we talked about the modeling, uh, you know, enforcing the rules, getting everybody to participate, but then the different types of groups call for some different uh, things as well. Forces from outside impact the group. Use them to your advantage. Uh, purpose, critical. Clear, applicable purpose to that person. Planning is critical. Plan the group for your own safety. Otherwise, it becomes a minefield. And you also can lose the handle on the group that way. Um, and again, the use of protocols and lesson plans. Every group, I feel, every group, and I would love to hear exceptions to this, should have a round, a dyad, or a triad, or an exercise in it. It's got to be fun. It can't just be talking. There's got to be more going on with this. Um, processing an exercise is at least as important as the exercise itself. Exercise is critical. Don't fall into the trap of, okay, here's the exercise. Thank you. Goodbye. Not enough. There's got to be a period of time where people can say, what did you learn from that? Absolutely critical. And it's brutally hard to fit all this stuff in one session. In video number two, we're gonna talk about how you compress all of this stuff into uh, one session and make it work for you. Other tips, watch your colleagues, as we said before. Get involved in a group on your own. I love the idea of going to the open uh, meetings. Go to a group, see what works, see what doesn't, and borrow from it. Uh, mention your own work, we got that already. Ask your clients what was good. Don't be afraid to ask what worked in the group. Or what did you like? What didn't you like? It's nice and even and balanced, and you can use that going forward. There is no perfect group. Every group you come away from, there's probably going to be something you said, ah, I could have done that. I should have done it. There's no perfect. Work for better. Just go for better. 
And I always tell people your first groups are your worst groups. So start wherever you start and then you just work your way up from there. Here's some of the materials that we, uh, we talked about. Um, the Corey uh, book, Theory and Practice of Group Counseling. Uh, Corey also has a series of videos called Groups in Action, which is really wonderful where you can see a, a process group uh, taking shape. Lots of this material and the little chapter references you saw come out of the Jacobs um, book. Uh, and the Jacobs book also has uh, some videos that go along with it that are very helpful as well. And the Yalom book that we talked about early on is uh, down here as well. That's a classic. You could probably find that used all over the place because I think everybody who's ever done groups since the 90s has a copy of that book, including me. So that's that information. Anyway, I thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to catch the rest of the videos in this series, uh, as well as maybe some of our other videos we talked about on stages of change and motivational interviewing and some of the other content we have. Thank you very much for your time. Hope to see you again soon. Take care.